glad that he will, church, and that he does, walks us through the troubles and trials, as well as the victories, the high moments and the low moments. The Lord is with us, praise God. I agree with Brother Malcolm, the choir did wonderful, every participant, everybody involved did wonderful. You know, it's just so sad that you work on something like that for weeks and weeks on end, hours go into it, and in 30 minutes or less, it's over. I think that in we ought to hear a little bit of that again sometime, at least some segment of it or some portion of it, be all right to hear again. It was very, very good, amen. If you have your Bibles tonight, let's go to Isaiah 38, we're going to get back into our study, and I would dare say that if you have been in the church for any length of time at all, you know about the story that we're about to read. You know about this occasion in the book of Isaiah. Very, very familiar. And the Lord willing tonight, we're going to go ahead and cover this entire chapter. And uh, it is 22 verses long. And so we'll read about the first eight verses here and then pause and come back and look at some more. Isaiah 38 and 1, it says, In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. Hezekiah being the king of Judah. He was sick unto death, and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed unto the Lord and said, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee, how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. Then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah, saying, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will add unto thy days fifteen years, and I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city. And this shall be a sign unto thee from the Lord, that the Lord will do this thing that he hath spoken. Behold, I will bring again the shadow of the degrees which is gone down in the sun dial of Ahaz, ten degrees backward. So the sun returned ten degrees by which degrees it had gone down. How many of you remember that? You're familiar with that story, the reading, the hearing of that story over the years. Let me tell you that the parallel passage that tells this story also is found in 2 Kings chapter 20. In 2 Kings chapter 20, we have the same reading, the same story. Only in that chapter, in 2 Kings, there are a few more details than we have here in Isaiah. And we'll look at one of them in this lesson tonight. The illness of Hezekiah, the sickness of Hezekiah, And we're led to believe this because of what is said in the 6th verse. I will deliver thee in this city out of the hand of King Assyria. And those that have run the references and the timelines and the chronology of Isaiah's life and the years and the decades and the centuries tell us that that because of the mention of Assyria and the judgment of the Lord upon Assyria and the battle of Assyria against uh, the, the kingdom of Judah that this would have put the timing somewhere around the 14th year of Hezekiah's reign. So about 14 years or so, he would have been the king of Judah, which would have been somewhere in the time frame of about 714 years B.C. before the time of Christ. You know, I've mentioned numerous times in this study, and it just really is remarkable at how at the detailed prophecy that Isaiah gives, much of which we're yet to see in our study about the coming Christ, the coming Messiah, over 700 years. You think about that. How long has America been a nation? 200 and what years? Over 700 years before the time of Christ, this prophet Isaiah 
in detail prophesied the coming of the Lord and even how he would suffer and how he would die. It's incredible, the revelation of God, amen, could only be known by God. But in looking at this story, there are a couple of lessons right off the bat that you and I need to be reminded of. One of them is that neither your greatness nor your goodness will exempt you from sickness and death. Now you think about that. Someone said America is great because America is good. And if if America ever ceases to be good, then she will cease to be great. I believe that. I particularly believe that. And I know a lot of good, good people. And I know a lot of godly people. I know a lot of great people that have been sick. And sickness comes. The Lord provides healing in the atonement. We know that. We pray for that. We have faith in that. We believe God for that. But should the Lord tarry and the return of the Lord not take place in our lifetime, we're going to grow old, we're going to wear out, and we're going to go, as David would say to his son, we're going to go the way of all the earth. That's just the teaching of the word of the Lord. So as great as Hezekiah was, and he was a good godly man, he did many great and godly things for the kingdom of Judah as their king, was a personal friend to the prophet Isaiah. Nevertheless, he became sick, and he became sick unto death. Our goodness and our greatness does not preclude that there is passed through sin and death in this world. We live in a fallen world, and sometimes there is sickness Hezekiah had been a mighty king and a mighty ruler, and the Bible said he had walked up right before God. He had, but he struck with a disease, which without a miracle will be mortal, will certainly be mortal. And he was struck with this disease, it appears, in the midst of his days. In other words, when he was strong, when he was fairly young, Bible scholars tell us that Isaiah would have been somewhere around 39 years old when he was smitten with his disease unto death. And during the days of his comforts and during the days of his usefulness, he got sick nonetheless. Now, I don't want to put anybody on the spot here today, but I don't believe there are very many people in this world that are any more godly than Debbie Gerald's or Brother Edward Gibbs, or Brother Jess Clark, or some of these other folks around here that are sick or have been sick or have had cancer or any number of other illnesses, godly people, righteous people, upright before the Lord. But because we have not fully realized, as Paul would say, the full redemption of our bodies. That's not, that's not happened yet. We groan like all creation, the Bible said. We groan and travail and wait for the full redemption of our bodies. That's just a lesson to keep in mind. And it doesn't have anything to do with your faithfulness or your righteousness or your godliness, your greatness or your goodness. It just happens sometimes. And we turn to God. We better turn to God and we better look to the Lord. Remember in John chapter 11, verse 3, Therefore, Lazarus now, therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. The one whom the Lord loved, Lazarus, was sick. In the days that Jesus was right there, walking among them, having fellowship with them, still Lazarus was sick and would die of his sickness. And the Lord, the Lord would bring him out. I don't want to make this a, a sad, dreary thing here, but lessons are to be learned. Amen. Amen. And that's one of them. Verse 1 says that the prophet Isaiah came to him and said, Set your house in order. Set your house in order. Someone said the duty of men and women, for that matter, in view of death, 
is to set their house in order. Nothing is greater than the duty of all men in view of their departure, which we know to be an absolute certainty, only doubtful in respect of its date, to arrange our worldly affairs as prudence requires and not leave them in confusion. In other words, you're going to leave here one day, folks. I'm going to leave here one day. We're all going to leave here one day. I'd like it to be the rapture. I sure would. But if it isn't the rapture, we're still going to leave here. Matthew Henry, one of the great commentators of generations ago, Matthew Henry said it this way, Set thy house in order, and thy heart especially. Put both thy affections and thy affairs into the best posture thou canst, that when the Lord comes, thou mayest be found of him in peace with God with thine own conscience, and with all men. And and listen to this. And mayest have nothing else to do but to die. (laughs) So that you don't have anything to do but to die. Our being ready for death will make it come never the sooner, but much the easier. And those that are fit to die are most fit to live. I believe that. It's kind, of, it's kind of another wording that says, watch and pray. Be ready unto the coming of the Lord. We don't know when he's coming. We don't know when we're going. But we know for certain it's going to happen. Set your house in order now while you have a chance so there's nothing left to do but die. Amen. Amen. Verse 2. Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Lord. Now, I know the image that we typically have of that. The image that we normally have is that Hezekiah is is standing there, and Isaiah walks in and says, "Uh, you set your house in order because you're going to die. The Lord has said you're going to die. And Hezekiah, brokenhearted at the words of the prophet Isaiah, would have turned around and faced the wall and prayed. But I doubt very seriously that's anything at all like what happened. Because the scripture says, and we read it here as part of these first verses, it says that he was sick unto death. And that tells me that Hezekiah was probably already on his deathbed. And there wouldn't have been any standing up and turning anywhere. It would have been more like Hezekiah rolling over and facing the wall and crying out to God in prayer. And the Bible said he wept sore. In fact, I looked a little bit into that and it said historians tell us that beds in that day seemed to have been placed in the corners of rooms with uh, the head against one wall of the room and one side against the other. And so Hezekiah, being sick unto death, being in, on his deathbed, would have turned best he could to the wall and begin to pray in distress unto the Lord. Think about that. Think about that. Well, thank God he prayed. When he was in distress, he prayed. And that was the custom and that was the practice. And that was the habit of Hezekiah. When he was sick, he prayed. When he was distressed by the oncoming armies of Assyria and the nations that would come against Judah, the Bible says he prayed. When he was still in health, We've already covered in this study how he went up into the house of the Lord and spread the letter out, remember that, before God, and he prayed unto the Lord. And now, when he's sick in bed, he turns his face to the wall and does what he always did, he prayed. If we don't pray in the good times, we're probably not going to pray in the bad times. It needs to be our habit to pray and to call upon the Lord. Amen. Daniel prayed out of his window three times a day. And so when he was thrown into the lion's den, well, what would he do? He'd do what he'd always done. He prayed. 
He prayed. And that's what people who pray do. They pray when times are good. They don't forget to pray then. And they pray when times are tough. So let's pray. And we're going to do that Sunday night. We're going to pray again and continue to pray. And this is what he said in verse 3. Remember now, O Lord. I I almost chuckle a little bit about that. Because the Lord doesn't forget anything. The Lord doesn't need to be reminded of anything. And I don't really think that's the the mode that maybe, I don't know. Maybe Hezekiah didn't know that and he thought God might forget. But you and I know that God is omniscient and knows all things and doesn't forget anything. But he's pleading his case. Remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. He pleads his case before the Lord. He's in the full vigor of his life. He doesn't want to be cut down at a young age. And he pleads to God. And and, and here's what's beautiful about it is that Hezekiah's conscience is clear and clean. And it becomes a strength to him when he cries out to God. There's no little secret anything there. There's no, there's no deceitfulness in his character at all. He says, God, you see. You know me better than I know myself. You know I've walked upright before you. You know I've lived a holy life before you. To the, it doesn't mean he was perfect, but he strived to live for God. And that becomes a strength to him in this time of need I'm telling you folks it means an awful lot to be able to lay your head down on your pillow at night and to be able to say I've not lied to anybody today I've not cheated anybody today I've not indulged in any known sin today no I don't earn my salvation by works and I'm not trying to get into heaven by being good enough but God I have I have tried to do my best before you today and walk up right before you and that means a lot when you're in trouble that means a lot it's not always the easiest thing to live that way but we'd better do it we'd better strive to do it so the testimony of his own conscience By the grace of God, he'd lived a good life, walked close, walked humbly before God. And it will be, that life will be a great support and comfort to him as he's looking death square in the face. And I want to tell you when that time comes, if you're able to say everything's all right, it is well with my soul, I got no worries, for when I shut my eyes here, I'll open them in heaven. When I take my last breath here, I'll take my first one in heaven. I want to tell you, you can't buy that with any amount of money. Praise God for it. He said, I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart. The word perfect there means whole. With a whole heart, I have walked upright before you. Now that's what he said. It's interesting to note what he could have said, but he didn't say. For example, Hezekiah doesn't say, Lord, you know how I have reformed this kingdom. And you know how I have taken away the high places. And how I have cleansed the temple. And how I have revived the neglected ceremonies. And I have brought this nation out of idolatry and turned their hearts back to you. He doesn't say he did all of that. He did do all of that as a great leader and man of God. But that's not what he appeals to. He appeals to his relationship with God. Lord, I've looked to you. I've lived for you. I've leaned upon you. Listen, you may not have any achievements to brag about. You may not have any exceptional goals that you've reached in life to be able to say, look here what I've done. But if you kneel before God and say, my heart, Lord, has been right before you and I've loved you and I've sought you and I've put my life in your hands, that moves God more anyway 
God's impressed by no man. Amen. Nothing we can do will impress him. Under the old law, there was nothing to prevent men from pleading their righteousness. This was pre-New Testament. This was pre the days of Paul saying, By faith through grace are we saved and not by works. This was pre any of that. And so it was not uncommon for Old Testament saints to put before God their holy living and say, Lord, doesn't this count for something? Job, for example, said in chapter 31, Doth not he see my ways and count all my steps? God knows, Job said. And in Psalm chapter 7, the psalmist said, O Lord my God, if I have done this, if there be iniquity in my hands, if I have rewarded evil unto him that was at peace with me, let the enemy persecute my soul and take it, yea, let him tread down my life upon the earth and lay mine honor in the dust. In other words, God, you know how I've lived. And if I've not lived right, if I've not lived holy, if I've not sought you in all my ways, then I deserve what I'm getting. But, oh, Lord, if I've lived before you an upright life, may it count for something. Now, I want to tell you that I believe Hezekiah understood that it was by the grace of God. I believe he understood that he could not depend upon his works as righteousness. I believe he knew that. But I believe when you're desperate, I believe it, you'll, you'll be reminded of the fact that, Lord, my life's in your hands. My life's always been in your hands. I committed my life to you when I was but a youngster. And I've lived for you all these days. Oh, Lord, hear my prayer. That's, there's a difference between that and believing that your works, a kind of legalistic approach, believing that your works earn you something before the Lord. And the Bible said he wept sore. He wept sore. You think about that. We get this notion sometimes that particularly men, strong men, uh, shouldn't weep and shouldn't cry. And that's just foolishness. I really wish I could cry more if you don't know the truth about it. I really do. I really wish I could cry more than I do cry. Um, I see strong men weep before God and it melts my heart. It doesn't make me think any less of them. And I look in the Word of God and I read where David wept for Jonathan. I read where David again wept for his son Absalom. I read where Joash wept when he heard the words of the law. Just heard the Bible, the word of the law read and he began to weep before God. I read where Nehemiah wept at the desolation of, of Jerusalem. And Hezekiah here is a king, king of Judah. And he weeps before the Lord. And I want to tell you, there's nothing wrong with that. No king puts himself under any restraint. If he has an inclination for tears or laughter, then let it be. So be it. You go ahead and you pour your heart out to God. And if you weep before God, I don't know why it is. I know everybody, everybody does it differently. Everybody's devotion is different. Everybody prays differently. Some people are, are always very loud and boisterous and, and some would say even demonstrative in their prayer. And, and that's okay. That's how they do it. I, I don't know about you, but for me, I cry more when I pray than any other time. I can't really pray without crying. I can't really get through to God without weeping before the Lord. And you know what? That's okay. God's not threatened by that. God doesn't have a problem with that. You're not weak because you do that. Hezekiah wept sore. And then verse 4, and I'll hurry here. Then verse 4, the word of the Lord came to Isaiah saying, and and you go to 2 Kings, the parallel passage, and read this. And it tells us more. It gives us more detail. Here it only tells us that God said to Isaiah, go back and tell him. 
In 2 Kings chapter 20 it tells us that before Isaiah ever even got halfway through the courtyard, God spoke to him and said, turn again and go back. Your footsteps have been arrested by the Lord. Go back and talk to him again and instruct him. Tell Hezekiah that I've given him 15 more years. Now you might not think 15 more years is very much, but that essentially doubled, doubled the reign of Hezekiah as king. And they didn't live back then like we live today. If they lived to be 50 years old, that was a good long life. 50 years in Bible times, you know, post the flood was a good long life. And we are told that Hezekiah lived to be 54 years old. God blessed him abundantly. You might not think that now, but God blessed him abundantly. God is swift to hear the prayer of faith, folks. As soon as Hezekiah prays the prayer of faith to God, immediately God is moved by it. I want to tell you, it doesn't take six weeks to get your prayers to God. And it doesn't take six weeks for God to hear them and six weeks for God to respond to you. I want to tell you, He sees and knows instantly. And He's gracious. And He has a gracious ear open to the prayers of His people. And so Isaiah is sent a second time. And when you come to verse 7, it says, And this shall be a sign unto thee from the Lord, that the Lord will do this thing that he has spoken. And he goes on to say, The Lord will cause the sun to go backward by by 10 degrees from, from where it has gone down. Now, we're not told in... Isaiah, but we are told in 2 Kings chapter 20 that that Hezekiah is given a choice. You're given a choice, we read in 2 Kings chapter 20 and verse 9. Isaiah said, this shall be, or this sign shalt thou have of the Lord, that the Lord will do the thing that he has spoken. Shall the shadow go forward 10 degrees or go back 10 degrees? And Hezekiah answered, It is a light thing for the shadow to go down 10 degrees, but let the shadow return backward 10 degrees. And Isaiah the prophet cried unto the Lord, and he brought the shadow 10 degrees backward by which it had gone down in the dial of Ahaz. Amen. He's given in Kings a choice. Isaiah only records the end result. But that choice is, I want, Hezekiah says, I want the harder one. The sun could go down, it seems, sooner, quicker. You ever watch the sun set? In seconds, it seems like when it reaches that point, it's behind the horizon. But what about if it went back up? That'd be much more difficult, we would think, than the natural progression. Well, that's what Hezekiah asked for. And time was rolled backward in the sundial of Ahaz. Now, I want to show you how crazy people can be. I want, I'm, that's right. People can be really crazy. Because in, in Isaiah, it says that he brought the shadow 10 degrees backward. But in 2 Kings, it says the sun returned 10 degrees backward. Now there's a difference. There's a difference. And there's such a difference that these smart, smart theologians, they say this, we must not press this expression as indicating a real alteration of the sun's place in the heavens. The meaning is that the shadow cast by the sun returned 10 degrees. In other words, the sun didn't go back 10 degrees, just the shadow in the dial went back 10 degrees. 
Why, any number of things could have made that happen. A, a partial cloud drifting by, I could have made that happen. Somebody's own shadow walking by the dial of Ahaz could have made that happen. And, and why these, these modern theologians can't stand the idea of anything being supernatural. So don't think that it really happened, they said, just a shadow happened. Except for the fact that it says in the Bible that the sun returned 10 degrees. No, God can do that. And, and they, I won't bother you with it. But, but they go on to talk about what it would have done to the gravitational forces of the earth and what it would have done to the sea and it would have flooded the, the world and all of these things that they know so much about forgetting that God made it all in the first place and the God that made it all can do with it anything he wants to. He's not bound by anything. But I just thought I'd tell you how smart some people are. They know these things. By the way, the sundial of Ahaz, I'm about to wrap this up with a reading here. The sundial of Ahaz, we are informed by Herodotus that it was an invention of the Babylonians that would have been passed on to the Assyrians and that Ahaz may have obtained a knowledge of it or an actual specimen, an actual uh, ha having one, somehow obtained one. But here's what I want to do. I want to take these last few minutes and I want to read this scripture to you, the remainder of this chapter. When you come to verse 9, it says, The writing of Hezekiah when he had been sick and was recovered of his sickness. In other words, after Hezekiah has been healed of God, after he's recovered and you know, I, I want you to know he did recover. I want you to know that. In other words, the Lord didn't just add 15 years and he lingered in illness for 15 years. That he just kept going down but somehow continued to survive that illness for 15 years. No, he was made whole again 15 more years. And when he had recovered from that, he sat down with a pen and he wrote out how he felt during that time of illness. And that's what the rest of this chapter is. And I know it's a few verses, but I want you, I want you to let me read it to you or you can read along with me. Verse 9 says, The writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, when he had been sick and was recovered of his sickness. Now this is him speaking. I said in the cutting off of my days... I shall go to the gates of the grave. I am deprived of the residue of my tears. I said I shall not see the Lord, even the Lord in the land of the living. I shall behold man no more with the inhabitants of the world. Mine age is departed and is removed from me as a shepherd's tent. I have cut off like a weaver my life. He will cut me off with pining sickness." From day even to night wilt thou make an end of me. I, will, I reckoned till morning that as a lion, so will he break all my bones. From day even to night wilt thou make an end of me. Like a crane or a swallow, so did I chatter. I did mourn as a dove. Mine eyes fail with looking upward. O Lord, I am oppressed. Undertake for me what shall I say he hath both spoken unto me and himself hath done it I shall go softly all my years in the bitterness of my soul O Lord by these things men live and in all these things is the life of my spirit so wilt thou recover me and make me to live behold for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. For thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. For the grave cannot praise thee, death cannot celebrate thee. They that go down to the pit cannot hope for thy truth. The living, the living, he shall praise thee. 
as I do this day. The Father to the children shall make known thy truth. The Lord was ready to save me. Therefore, we will sing my songs to the stringed instruments all the days of our life in the house of the Lord. For Isaiah had said, let them take a lump of figs and lay it for a plaster upon the boil and he shall recover. Hezekiah also had said, what is the sign that I shall go up to the house of the Lord? And so in the reading of the remainder of the verses of this chapter, you have Hezekiah, you have him admitting to the fact that he was in total despair. He'd given up. He figured it was over. There, it's done. God is going to let this happen to me. But somewhere about two-thirds of the way into that, when the healing comes, he is grateful to God for the Lord's hand outstretched to touch him. And Isaiah obeyed the Lord, put that plaster upon the boil, and he was healed and made whole by the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that, isn't that a wonderful story? Stand with me, if you will. I know that, I know that we're very familiar with the first part of that chapter and the first part of what happens there with set thine house in order for thou shalt die and not live. But when you look at that whole entire chapter and how it, how it happened and what place prayer had and Hezekiah's own words, there's a great fullness to it. Amen. And I'm thankful to, that God has given it to us. And the same God that healed Hezekiah still heals today. He does. He still heals today. We all know that death comes at some point in time. We know not when. But until such time, we know there's power in the blood of Jesus to heal and to make whole. Let's thank Him for that right now. Father, in Christ's name, we rejoice in You and we rejoice in Your Word tonight. Lord, may we strive to emulate not only Isaiah here, but Hezekiah also. To walk upright before You. To live a perfect or a whole life, wholly devoted to you. Lord, may we be ready for whatever may come, but may we strive to bring honor and glory to your name. We thank you for it, ask you for it, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, church.